I don't think the Dreamcast really needs any introductions. It was the last Sega console, and it really didn't do too hot. It was released in North America on September 9th, 1999, and was discontinued on March 31st, 2001. Even though it had a short lifespan, the Dreamcast had its fans and continues to draw more to this day, myself included. I didn't start collecting for the console till very recently, and I'd say I have a sizable collection. This is coming from the fact that none of my local friends are Dreamcast collectors, so having any games is more than most people I know. Of course, this means dealing with insane prices. It's not like the PS2 where you have an endless sea of cheap titles to snag. Eventually, I ended up trying to hunt down Project Justice due to its rarity and insane price tag. It's like, alright, why is this so expensive? I'm curious. Well, here it is. I got a good deal for it, and it's an extremely clean copy. What is it, you ask? It's a 3D fighter from Capcom that's exclusive to the Dreamcast. Project Justice is very interesting not only in terms of the game itself, but more so its reputation and presence within the retro gaming scene. It is both known and not known. But little did I know, Project Justice has kind of been in front of my face this whole time without me realizing it. More on that later. In terms of quality, it's both good and not as good as the plethora of other fighting games on the Dreamcast. However, at the same time, it sticks out as having some features that make it unique. Not gonna lie, I got a little obsessive going down this rabbit hole to uncover Project Justice and its legacy while also comparing it to other releases on the console. So for this first DC Fossil Review, we'll be looking at Project Justice while comparing it to its competitors. I, myself, am not really a huge fighting game fan, however there are a few games that have captivated me through the years. Typically it's other people getting me into the games. Recently, my friend Tyson bought me Tekken 8 as he's been trying to recruit people to spar with, and you know what, I've been having a blast with it. My older brother is a fan of the genre, and it's because of him that as a kid, I was super into Street Fighter Alpha 3 and Capcom vs. SNK 2. I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Remember this game and cover, because, well, it's gonna come up again. I bring all this up because at first glance, I had no idea what Project Justice was beyond it being a fighting game. I thought it was maybe because I'm not super into the scene, maybe it's well known and I just live under a rock. Before doing any extensive research, I booted up the game to play it fresh. Didn't want any kind of info online to tarnish my views on it or give me any kind of bias. When the game starts, you get kind of a slideshow with text mentioning that it's been a year since someone was causing all sorts of hell. Yep, Project Justice is a sequel. The first game is called Rival Schools United by Fate, and it was released on PS1. Editor, pause. I need to mention that, like most funny games, Rival Schools and Project Justice were in the arcade. It doesn't really affect the narrative of the video, but... Probably should mention that yes, he's had arcade cabinets. Project Justice is called Project Justice Rival Schools 2 outside of the US. Not exactly sure why we didn't get the same title, but it, I can make some baseless assumptions. Anyway, I love the style of this main menu. Even more so, I absolutely love this character select screen for the story mode. There's a map showing where each school is located, and you get full body previews of the characters you are choosing. Kind of a small gripe, but sometimes I hate when fighter selection screens are just faces. Like, who are some of these people? But of course, it only take a few play sessions to memorize who everyone is. Regardless, this is a cool character select screen. Not knowing what happened in the first game isn't a huge deal as the plot for Project Justice kind of stands on its own. References are made to the previous plot, but with some context clues you can kind of piece together the holes. Speaking of the story, this is where Project Justice is kind of cool. You pick a school, which as previously mentioned, has three characters, and those are the central characters to that particular storyline. Instead of picking one character and seeing a similar story, Project Justice has branching and crossing paths. For example, there's times where other characters join or leave your team. Sometimes you interact with characters during the story that, when we're playing as those said characters, you get to see their side of the events. The ending and certain other events do change depending on the school you picked, so what's canon and not can get a little messy, but hey, it's all still good fun. It'd be a little easier to show you, so let's go through a story while also talking about the combat. Let's take my favorite school, Gorin. I assume that's how that's pronounced. Let's get something out of the way now. I'm probably going to mispronounce everything, so get ready to cringe. I apologize ahead of time. The story starts with the Gorin students hearing a plea for help. A little girl is complaining that someone's chasing them and being all creepy. Turns out it's a familiar face for the Gorin crew, and he's not acting right. They call him Batsu, but in the Versus screen, it's Vatsu. Very suspicious indeed. Well, time to fight. 
Here's the first chance to pick the order you want your fighters. The first pick will be the fighter you use. The other picks determine which combinations you need to press on the controller to call them in for a team-up attack, which I'll explain in a moment. The story sometimes forces which characters you use in what order. It's kind of rare, but it does add a little bit of challenge. You can't just use the one character you're good with to breeze through the matches. At this point, we can finally start talking about the fighting. I'm not really an expert in Project Justice yet, but the gameplay is pretty simple. You got your light kicks and punches, then your heavy kicks and punches. This gets expanded when you combine movement plus the attack button. There's a whole range of attacks you have. Of course, you got your moves that come out based on a certain input. Think like your Hadoukens in Street Fighter, but in the example I'm showing, it's Shoma throwing a baseball. The more advanced inputs lead to triggering a Burning Vigor attack. Should look familiar to supers or grooves or whatever you want to call them. You also have a grab, which is useful. There's also a sidestep I forget to use all the time, so I probably have no footage of it unless it's the AI doing it to me. Probably the most advanced mechanic out of all this is the combos, or more specifically the air combos. Here's a video I've been using to learn the game after several attempts of failing many bosses, or hell, the final boss. Look at this air combo. You aren't going to see me do this a whole lot unless by the time I'm editing this together I've gotten better. The coolest part, at least for me, is the team up attack or assists, whatever you want to call them. Pressing heavy and light kick at the same time, or heavy and light punch at the same time, will bring in one of your partners. Each character has their own assist, but there are two main differences. Some just come in to rebuild your meter or restore your health or a mix of both. The others do actual damage. A lot of these are outlandish, some are funny, and some are, uh... Yeah, I don't know. I didn't learn until I watched the previously mentioned video that if you press all three buttons at the same time, all three fighters come out to do a crazy attack that deals a ton of damage. Of course, Burning Vigor and Assists cannot be spammed as they use charge from the meter, so you got to plan accordingly, especially when you can't choose from the entire roster to build a perfectly synergized team. So that's the arsenal. It's not as crazy as you think, but this game is a classic case of easy to pick up and hard to master, like most fighting games, I guess. But since I'm just playing the AI, really I just want a strategy that helps me win, and that is uh, just hoping the moves trigger when I vaguely input the commands and spamming certain combos that I can reliably pull off. Alright, so we beat the first fight because it's relatively easy. It's episode one after all. The weird acting Batsu leaves. The little girl who was scared clings to Shoma. This causes a bit of an issue as Shoma being a little immature gets infatuated with the intention. Which is, uh... uh, uh it's unfortunately part of the plot. Momo, the little girl, is like, Ha, Natsu, you jealous? And this leads to the friends having a fight, because you see Natsu has a thing for Shoma. This is one of the examples of a branching path. If you pick Shoma and Momo, then win the fight, the plot will continue with just these two as the other characters go their own way. Shoma and Momo continue to run into other characters, with Momo antagonizing every group they pass. Believe me when I say I spam Momo's assist, because not only is it funny, but it does do damage. Here, we get to see one of the coolest fighters, Ran. She uses her camera in combat. I don't know why I think this is so dope, but uh, I love this. We also meet Chairperson. That's her name, Chairperson. She goes by her title in the student government. From what I can tell in a brief Google search, her name is legit unknown. Anyway, in the end, Momo tells Shoma thanks for letting her fight every school and that he's been a huge help. Turns out Momo was used by this assassin named Koro to cause dissent among the schools. You see, the schools overcome challenges by the power of friendship, and this is a theme of Project Justice and rival schools in general. When friends are together, anything is possible. Kuro's whole objective was to rule Japan by isolating the characters and assassinating certain families, or something like that. Point is, Kuro's a bad dude. Some of the plot details are explained in another school story, which is cool about Project Justice. You're enticed to play as each school to piece together the whole thing. Anyway, when Shoma realizes what had happened, he had been used, he makes amends with his friends and they proceed to lay the smack down on this assassin and Momo. When the two flee, they fall into Justice High where a character is turning into like a demon, I think? This guy was one of the antagonists in the first game and now like Kuro was brainwashing him, I think, and ends up being possessed by their father, who was one of the antagonists in the first game? Something about his hatred being so great, he was able to manifest into his son's body or something? I don't know. I don't think any of that just made sense as I said it out loud. But the story does get a little unhinged and wacky. But I think that's kind of part of the appeal. The characters talk about how, as friends, they can bring down this demon. And they band together for one final fight. One of which had me gripping the controller so hard that I could hear the plastic almost breaking. This fight is so annoying. It's here I want to bring up the HP bars. That health bar doesn't look like much, but then you start fighting and you see it slowly trickles. It's not a con or a bad thing, but lord, do I feel so discouraged when I land what I think is a good combo and the health bar doesn't move. 
Meanwhile, the final boss does like one move and a quarter of my health disappears. It's so frustrating. When I finally defeat the boss, I see the ending for Gorin. It's all goofy and happy and whatnot. Uh, happy ever after. There is a bit of a cliffhanger-ish thing with Kuro disappearing, but the rival school story would end here. Well, there is a comic, but I'm not sure how much it expands the lore or continues the story. As of this video, there is not a third rival school's game. So yeah, that's Project Justice. You have a few more modes that I haven't mentioned, such as League and Tournament Battles, but the real meat and potatoes is the story modes and Versus if you have friends to compete with. It's worth noting that your Japanese version has a board game minigame that allows you to create your own student. This would be extremely difficult to fumble through as it's so text heavy. You could Google Translate as you went, but man, there's a lot to read. I think it's one of those things that you can only truly enjoy if you know the language. After putting some time into Project Justice, I was kind of curious as to why the game is seemingly neglected. None of my friends have really heard of it. It's a Capcom game that hasn't spawned more sequels. It seems like it has been left around on the Dreamcast, or PS1, if you consider Rival Schools. Well, truthfully, I learned that the fighting game scene frequently discusses both titles. You'll find community side tournaments at EVO for Project Justice. Here right. we go. Oh, nice oh, interrupt already. In the air. Oh, the oh, pit. <laughs> the Crouching. Oh, yeah, that's why I said Saki's normals can, take, uh, can get her out. Or can zone her out, and... Here's the first one. Yep, there you go, the loops. But outside of the fighting game community, and I guess more specifically in places like my circles, my groups online, Project Justice is just a little unknown. I think it doesn't help that it's on a system not many people owned, combined with the fact it was released on May 16th, 2001, which is after Sega announced it was ending support for the Dreamcast. So the only people picking this up are people still rocking the console and buying new games for it. What makes this worse is the Dreamcast is home to a ton of fighting games, a lot of which received PS2 versions later down the road, or at least some sort of sequel. So it's easy to see how, just by sheer presence of other, more notable franchises, Project Justice could become so hidden. But maybe, just maybe, Project Justice is genuinely not as good as other titles. As kind of an experiment, I decided to enlist my friend Ashley in helping me explore other fighting games. A fellow casual, if you will. I didn't tell her outright at the beginning that this video was going to be about Project Justice, but eventually I did say, you know, what do you think of these games and how does it compare to Project Justice? But primarily, we played fighting games on the Dreamcast with the goal being, in the end, we'd rank them from best to worst. For further testing, I played single player modes as well, just to compare for myself. We played a lot of games, but I really only wanted to focus on a few that stood out to me or I feel would be entertaining to bring up in this video. First, I want to talk about Dead or Alive 2. <laughs> Now, I do have a bit of a nostalgia bias for this franchise, solely because I do have some vague memories of Dead or Alive 3 for the original Xbox. With that out of the way, I have to admit that immediately, I instantly had a blast. Dead or Alive just makes you feel like you're a pro with how easy combos and other moves are pulled off. Sure, I bet if I played someone who knew what they were doing, I'd see true high tier gameplay, but generally speaking, I feel a lot more comfortable in this game. Also, look at these graphics. Quick disclaimer, I am playing all this in emulator, as directly capturing off Dreamcast is a little annoying, specifically via Muse, as they hold very little space, and uh, kind of not a fan of the controllers. So yeah, in an emulator, even with default settings, the games are going to look a little better, but even then, you can still see the vast difference in graphical fidelity. Dead or Alive's environments are pretty detailed, with the main feature being able to push characters through a window or railing and begin fighting on a whole different area. The matches are also quick, as the health bars deplete pretty rapidly. Unlike the underwhelming feeling of Project Justice, Dead or Alive 2 really sells home the impact of each attack. It's intense. It's fun. About the only complaint I have is on my quick gameplay session, I found the story to be pretty much impossible to follow. Like, what the hell is going on? I don't know, the story could be in the manual or something. 
When it comes to Project Justice versus Dead or Alive 2, the only things Project Justice does better are the unique characters and the branching plot paths. When it comes to everything else, uh, I would rather play Dead or Alive 2 if I had to choose. My friend Ashley felt similar, specifically citing the dynamic nature of the stages. Being able to just knock a player through the window or something, it just adds a lot. Let's talk about Soul Calibur. Alright, so this is some heavy nostalgia bias, more so than Dead or Alive 2, as I played the absolute bejesus out of Soul Calibur 2 on the GameCube as a kid. Because of this, I won't talk about it too in depth. However, again, look at the differences in graphics. At this point, I do have to admit that yes, the art styles are different between Project Justice and DOA and Soul Calibur. However, I still think the graphical differences are quite astonishing to see. I can't think of a better example than this classroom setting. The characters seem like miniatures compared to the huge background. The whole perspective is off. Meanwhile, Soul Calibur really does appear like these fighters are duking it out in real locations. They fit. It blends into the overall visuals, not leading to this sense of what in the world is going on in the background. The actual gameplay is not as accessible as Dead or Alive, or at least not to me, as it's fully not clear how certain moves are performed, but the difficulty is just as forgiving enough that I was able to get through the story fairly easily. So between Soul Calibur and Project Justice, I'm gonna have to say I'd rather play Soul Calibur. My friend Ashley agreed with me, but... Is her reasoning was purely based on nostalgia, though. Which is fair, honestly. Let's switch from 3D to 2D and talk about Street Fighter Alpha 3. Now, I know switching from 3D to 2D, the overall experience is going to be drastically different, but it is the same genre at the end of the day, and also just videos for fun anyways. This ain't like an academic essay. The main reason I want to talk about Alpha 3 is, one, it's another game that I have a lot of nostalgia for, and I just don't know when I'll ever talk about it again, so this is a good opportunity. But two, mainly... Alpha 3 is a good example of hellaciously good style and hype. Just here. You I suck at Alpha 3. I'm not really good at these types of fighting games where you gotta do quarter circles and stuff. But I love playing Alpha 3 due to the excitement is the word I'm gonna use. It feels like an event playing this game. Of course, all the environments are incredible. The character designs are timeless. It's all really good fun. It just feels like you're part of something playing this. It's kind of hard to describe. Street Fighter Third Strike, a game that to this day is considered one of, if not the best fighting games ever, was also on Dreamcast, sporting a dedicated song for the character selection screen. Every menu, every piece of text, everything is so stylized and just plain cool, honestly. But the point is, when it comes to Alpha 3 and Third Strike, even though I suck at them, I'd rather play those in Project Justice. And again, my friend Ashley agreed. She mentioned that these games are very difficult to play, but when me and her were playing together, it seems more fun playing a game that has all this hype behind it. And, uh, yeah. Speaking of openings, King of Fighters Dream Match 99 has a pretty awesome animated intro. gonna talk more about this game but we didn't play a whole terrible lot of it the emulator had some graphical bugs so I won't criticize the visuals as we may not be seeing the accurate representation the sound and no OST is pretty good I did find out that this is more so an updated version of King of Fighters 98 which makes me not want to poop all over it considering that from what I gather online 98 is considered one of the best games in the franchise really I'm just bringing this up because man that intro is sick but anyway time to sum all this up right we we took the games we we started playing on Dreamcast and we decided to rank them. And we had such a good time with this that we ended up playing games on other consoles like PS1 and PS2. 
and we've just been ranking what we consider the best games. It's, it's just been something fun for me and her to do in our spare time. But the point is, in the end, Project Justice, for me and Ashley, rated about around the middle of our personal rankings. It's not the best game. It's not the worst game. I find it to be the most interesting for its story and characters. Ashley finds it fun with friends due to the ridiculous nature of some of the moves. However, we would rather play a few other games besides it if given a choice. In fact, after checking out Rival Schools on PS1, I'd actually much rather play that game, despite the graphics being arguably worse. But hey, this video is long enough without looking at more titles, but yeah, I, I liked Rival Schools more. The point is not to demean or crap on Project Justice. This exercise was more so for me to have a better perspective, as again, I'm not familiar with the genre. If I had not played any other games, I would have made a video that being like, guys, Project Justice is the greatest thing ever and you should play it. Now, after playing everything else, I'd say, you know, Project Justice is a great game that you should check out if you're a fan of Capcom fighters and needing something new to explore. Yeah, I like that. Both are good assessments, but now I don't think you should drop everything to give it a peek. I can definitely say, it's not worth the insane price it continues to fetch for. Project Justice is a great game, but one that is overshadowed by its competition and its neglect by Capcom. Project Justice characters have shown up in other titles, such as Capcom vs. SNK2. Remember when I told you to remember this cover? Yeah, Project Justice has been in front of my eyes the whole time. This dude is from both Rival Schools and Project Justice. But besides some cameos without re-releases or a sequel, I think Project Justice will forever be hidden away with its existence being kept alive by the dedicated community still bringing it to tournaments. This was a fun exploration and probably some of the most fun I've had recording for a video. Me and my friend Ashley had a good time just beating the crap out of each other while gathering footage for this video. We are still, for fun, exploring the vast range of titles available in that genre. So if you want to hear me talk about more fighting games, believe me I can, though I feel like I'm going to trigger a lot of people in this video. The most the most casual ranty thing about fighting games and I probably trashed on some stuff that people are going to hate me for, but hey, remember this is all in good fun. If there's any games in this video you saw you want a more in-depth video of, let me know and I'll consider it. If there's anything on Dreamcast you'd like to see, let me know. This is DC Fossil now after all. But yeah, uh, until then, I'll see you in the next video, the next episode of whatever that may be.